ready. We're good? Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الذين آمنوا والذين هادوا والنصارى والصابئين من آمن بالله واليوم الآخر وعمل صالحا فلهم أجرهم عند ربهم ولا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون وإذ أخذنا ميثاقكم ورفعنا فوقكم الطور خذوا ما آتيناكم بقوة واذكروا ما فيه لعلكم تتقون ثم توليتم من بعد ذلك فلولا فضل الله عليكم ورحمته لكنتم من الخاسرين رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحد العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد once again everybody السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته of the things I spoke about yesterday one thing that sticks out that I think some academics some scholars have also talked about and uh, non-Muslim scholars as well and uh, it, it comes across as almost uh, an accusation of error in the Quran is that the Quran accuses the Banu Israel the children of Israel the Yehud in particular of killing prophets and this is mentioned in one way or the other about nine times in the Quran and uh, if you study the Bible overall it's made the claim is made that there's no reference to you know the Israelites killing their prophets disobeying yes disregarding yes almost stoning yes but killing them this is a false accusation made by the Quran etc as a matter of fact there are references they are few and far between I wanted to share some of them with you. There's also parabiblical literature, other literature, especially Christian literature that cites quite a bit of this in, in uh, the history of Banu Israel. So for instance, in the book of Jeremiah, there's a prophet by the name of Uriah, son of Shemaiah, and they, they, literally the, the, the citation is when Jezebel was butchering the prophets of Yahweh, when the Lord asks, now this is another citation about a prophet named Elijah, when the Lord asks him, what he's doing there, Elijah responds, I am full of jealous zeal for Yahweh's Sabbath, because the Israelites have abandoned your covenant and have torn down your altars and put your prophets to the sword. I am the only one left, and now they want to kill me. So this is one of many citations. There's actually a pretty interesting uh, paper on this uh, that I want to make reference to, inshallah. Gabriel Reynolds has a paper on this non-Muslim writer, uh, an expert in Quranic studies from a Western academic point of view. And he's written a paper called Quran and Jews as Killers of Prophets. So you can look that up, inshallah ta'ala, and do some reading on your own. Just one more citation that off of his paper I'll read off to you guys. Uh, this is quoting the Levites, and this is in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, but they grew disobedient, talking about the Banu Israel. They grew disobedient, rebelled against you, meaning God, and thrust your law behind their backs. This is actually a phrase used exactly in the Quran. Nabaduhu wara'a zuhurihim. They threw it behind their backs. And that's exactly the phrasing in the Bible as well. They slaughtered your prophets who had reproved them to bring them back to you and committed monstrous impieties. So this idea of them killing the prophets is not an invention of the Quran. This is certainly found in their literature as well. And it's, it's again far more graphic than what we have. Now we're coming to an ayah which is the source of a lot of controversy in, circle, in, in certain circles. And this ayah is probably going to take me on its own a half hour to explain because it's just that important. But the first thing to note here is that when we come to an ayah and it's unfortunately been you know, surrounded by disagreement, dis difference of opinion, even controversy as I'm suggesting, then the, the, you know, the, the, the khatib, the imam, the speaker or student like myself, we get caught up in the controversy and we start studying the ayah in light of defending it against the false claims or what we don't think are viable claims made against that ayah, but we don't actually look at the ayah for what it is. So we spend a lot of time discussing what the ayah is not and how not to understand it and then to understand it against this misunderstanding but rather not giving credit to the ayah for what it actually represents and what it's doing in, in, in the surah and where it's placed, right? So this, this becomes unfortunately a study of we're going to learn a lot of things about the ayah but not learn a lot of things, uh, not, not learn the ayah itself. It's like a lot of people who talk about the importance of the Qur'an but not actually say anything from the Qur'an itself. 
you know? So you're kind of circling around the subject. So the first thing I want to do actually, as I translate this ayah for you, is to try to illustrate some of the benefits of this ayah and where it's placed. Let's just talk about what it's doing here first and what we can extrapolate. And then inshallah, we'll look at some of the possible misunderstandings that have resulted in a, yet again quite a bit controversy in the ummah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا وَالنَّصَارَى وَالصَّابِئِينَ No doubt those who've believed, those who, now this is difficult to translate, it could be translated those who returned, those who came back, and it could also be those who were Jewish. So this could be a, verb, a verbal use of the phrase Yahud in the past tense. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا So those who returned or those who were Jewish. We'll dive into that a little bit deeper for now. So far two groups have been mentioned, the Muslims and the Jews, right? When Nasara and the Christians, which is again a unique Quranic phraseology, we'll get to that too, was Sabi'een and the Sabians, which is again another interesting group that we're going to have to have a discussion about. So far, four groups have been mentioned, without a doubt, those who believed, those who were Jewish, the Christians, and the Sabians. Was Sabi'een. Man amana billahi wal yawmil akhiri wa amila salihan. Whoever were to believe in Allah and the last day and to do a good uh, act righteously. Actually, salihan here you can look at as a hal. So they acted righteously. It's probably a bad translation here to say, and did good deeds. That would be amilu as salihat. That's not their language here. It's amila salihan. And this would be a hal translation, acted righteously. They did things in a way that was good. فَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ Then they have their compensation, their fair compensation, that with their master, with their lord. وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْسَنُونَ and there is no fear on them. I've explained that before. This is an echo from the time of Adam alayhi salam. That's already been mentioned. It was yet again told to Banu Israel and now it's coming up again. So, وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْسَنُونَ And they're not going to be the ones to grieve. Now what is this ayah doing there? Time and time again you see Banu Israel leaning on the fact that they are chosen by Allah and Allah has given them tafdeel عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ أَنِّي فَضَّلْتُكُمْ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ I gave you preference over all other nations thinking that this label of being Muslim, which for them is the label of being Bani Israel, that label is enough for them to be in Allah's favor. They can get away with pretty much anything because now they are chosen by Allah. Allah is highlighting a particular disease that certain people have, that the sticker that they have on them, the label that they have on them should be enough and they don't have to prove themselves to Allah in any way. They are already from the saved group and this is a disease that doesn't just hit them, who else can it hit? It hits us. And by the, as a matter of fact, a large contingent of any major world religion that has a, fo a major following actually tends to believe this. At least we're in the right one. We don't have to do much now that we're, now we're in. We got our entrance ticket already. I already said my shahada. I'm already a Muslim. Everything else will be fine. What does this ayah do? It actually has, from a grammar point of view, it has two mubtada. And what that means is it's, it starts off a sentence. And then instead of ending that sentence, starts it off over again. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا وَالنَّصَارَ وَالصَّابِئِينَ مُبْتَدَى Starting again, مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا Why? Why start the sentence over again? First, the ayah is about the labels, the religious labels. Those who've believed, meaning the Muslims. Those who were Jewish. Those who are Christians. Those who are Sabians. These are all the different labels people have in their religion. But Allah says the reality of it is far more important than these labels. The reality of it is, any of you, any of you, so what is the, the, the essential heart of the matter? Whoever truly believed in Allah, who truly believed in Allah, and truly believed in the last day, and acted righteously. I want to see action and actual faith. I want to see what's in the heart, and I want to see the action manifest. And acted righteously. For the, for, then those people have compensation. You're not just going to get compensation because you are a member of Banu Israel. That's not how it works. That's not how it's ever worked. So never lean on that label. That was the point of this ayah. Now how is unfortunately has this ayah been looked at? The way in which unfortunately this ayah has been looked at is, look, Allah says Jew, uh, Muslims, Jews, Christians, and God knows who these people are, the Sabians, all of these guys put together, whoever among them believed in or did three things, believe in Allah, and the last day, that's two things now. And then acted righteously, that's your third thing. So there's only three things required of any person. They have to believe in God, they have to believe in the last day, and they have to act righteously. It doesn't matter if they're Jewish, or Christian, or Muslim, or Sabian. They just have to do these three things. And if they can do these three things, then the ayah is saying, فَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ They have their compensation with their master. 
there's la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahsanun there's no fear on them they don't have to worry about it they don't have there's no grief that they're going to have to suffer in other words you don't have to believe in this prophet you don't have to believe in muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam you could just do three things believe in allah believe in the last day and act righteously you're good to go and so why are we even preaching the message of Islam to anybody? We can just tell them, if you're Jewish, that's fine. Just be a good Jew. And if you're a Christian, just be a good Christian. Do good things. And your Islam says you're perfectly fine the way you are. That's the message of this ayah. First of all, that doesn't even make sense from the context of the ayah. Why? Because from the very beginning, the first time Iman was mentioned, وَآمِنُوا بِمَا أَنزَلْتُ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعَكُمْ What's the entire criticism of Banu Israel? Is the criticism of the Israelites in the entire ayat that are coming before that they don't believe in Allah? No, most certainly they do believe in Allah. Is there criticism that they don't follow the prophets? Yeah, they don't follow revelation. Yeah, that's the problem. They don't believe in revelation that they had and actually they've rejected the revelation that Allah has sent them. And by rejecting that revelation, Allah didn't say, well, it's okay, at least you follow Torah. So you're good. As a matter of fact, the statement of Allah is وَلَا تَكُونُوا أَوَّلَا كَافِرٍ بِهِ Rejecting the Qur'an makes you the first in line of those who've done kufr. So for us to assume that here it's not calling for them to accept the final revelation, they're fine the way they are, is a major problem. But before we go into the previous context and what's coming ahead, it's important to understand the ayah itself. There's a few things I wanted to share with you. The lar in the larger context, it's very clear. The entire conversation is about believing in the final revelation. That you can't like miss that reality that overshadows all of the ayat of Bani Israel that we're studying. Okay. Then of course, even the first thing that was told to them was live by the revelation I've given you. Awfu bi ahdi, ufi bi ahdikum. Fulfill my promise made with you through revelation. So the idea of skipping revelation is absurd. But let's look at the ayah itself. Let's look carefully inside the ayah itself and explore what exactly is it that Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying. The first thing I want you to note here is you know, the, uh, the, the terminology used for all of these groups. It's very beautiful. And so first we understand who these four groups are. First Allah said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ amanu, Those who have believed. Allah did not qualify it with anything else. He didn't say believe in Allah or believe in the last day or believe in nothing. It's just إِنَّ الَّذِينَ amanu. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ amanu. And so Allah is actually opening the invitation to all of humanity to be part of this group. Every other group mentioned hereafter is actually specific to a, either a, an ethnicity or a particular group. But when you say, Alladina amanu, those who have believed, then it's, this is an open-ended invitation. Anybody can join in. The second group that's mentioned, I love this phrasing, I told you when, I, when Allah says, Walladina hadu, why did He say, Wal Yahud? Wal Yahud. Because you could say, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالْيَهُودُ وَالنَّصَارَى وَالصَّابِئِينَ He could say it like that. He didn't say it like that. He actually said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا When you say هَادُوا, it creates, once again, is the wajud dalala. Two things at once. One thing it means is those who returned. And the other thing it means is those who were Jewish. If you say al yahud it only means one thing, which is what? The Jews. Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, among the Jewish people, those who actually came back to Allah and made tawbah. Actually, the word for hada yahudu in the Quran, even inna hudna ilayk, bi ma'na inna tubna ilayk. You know, we, we make tawbah to you, we return back to you. Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to say two things at once. One, I'm talking about a group of the Jewish people. Two, the group within them that actually came back to me. This echoes what's already been said because the call made to them was Fataba alaykum innahu huwa tawwabur rahim tubu ila bari'ikum come back to your master come back to your creator he's the one who accepts when you come back to him and now Allah says of those that were invited to come back to Allah and actually came back subhanallah it's actually iman and tawba in inna alladhina amanu wal ladhina hadu the two things here are iman and tawba and this is something you find coupled in the Quran in other places you know, taba wa amana wa amila amalan salihan. You know, you have tawbah and iman coupled with each other. The same thing here. Inna ladina amanu wa ladina hadu. Then the interesting third piece of this equation is wa nasara. And nasara, interestingly, there's another word available. You could say nasraniyun. Nasraniyun, or you could say masihiyun. That's the term common at the time for Christians. Nasara was not the common term used for Christians. This is something the Quran basically invented for them. Like Allah is calling them with a name that they didn't use for themselves. 
the, the singular form of Nasara is actually Nasran or Nasir. Nasran or Nasir, which is again is Diwajud Dalala. Nasran actually comes from Nasrani. And Nasrani is actually a, 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 a variation of the Aramaic. It's the people, you may have heard Jesus of Nazareth, right? So the people of Nazareth were Nasrani. And so Allah is first of all making reference to the original followers of Isa alayhi salam here. Not just any Christians. Those from Nasran. The original, original Sahaba of Isa who the Quran calls the Hawariyun. Who the same word occurs for Man Ansari ilallah qal al-Hawariyun nahnu Ansarullah. That phrasing is used to describe Allah is now talking about those not just who have Iman whenever and not just those who turn back to Allah but those who consistently aided the Prophets in their own missions who were by the side of the Prophets and the prime example of that were those who were willing to even sacrifice themselves in their loyalty to Isa alayhi salam and they've been given this honor by calling them Nasara Now the, from the Arabic side of things the word Nasara originates from the word Nusra and Nusra means to provide heavy aid or heavy help what they're, meaning the assistance they provided to their messenger is no small thing. And by using the ism, it's as though, and this is actually, it, it, it corresponds with what they had done. Uh, you know, because if Allah said, If you said it like that, then it would actually be just any group who helped. But if you say, nasara again, two groups are included. The two things about them are being told at the same time. These are the original followers of Jesus, and at the same time, or they represent those same teachings, and at the same time, they were those who helped him. They, they were the Ansarullah. Both of those meanings are captured inside the beautiful word An Nasara. So, just to say Christians is actually an oversimplification here. Then you get to the most complicated of these four terms, which is As Sabi'een. I translated it as Sabians, not to be confused with the kingdom of Saba or Sheba. That's something else. Now the Sabi'een, there's lots and lots of kalam about who the Sabi'een are. There was no clarity among the ulama because this was an obscure term used and it actually makes you wonder why Allah Azza wa used this term. What the most we can tell is that this group is known at the time of the Prophet Wasallam. It seems like they're a scattered group, they're away from most people, they're not, they don't interact much. A lot of our scholars of the past believe that these are a variation of the people of the book. Some believe they're a group of uh, you know, not so mainstream Christians that uh, are still found in some parts of southern Iraq. And they believe in the, in the teachings of Yahya alayhi salam, John the Baptist, that's who they follow. And they have a lot of obscure writings. I'm not so convinced of that position. but. What I do find peculiar about this group, one of the one of the most interesting things about this group, is that Allah Azza wa Jalla used the word Sabaa from the word Sabaa, the word Sabiin for them. And Sabaa in Arabic means Kharaja min dinin ila dinin akhar. Sabaa bi ma'na he left one religion and joined another one. Converts, what you call converts nowadays, one of the words for that in Old Arabic is Sabi. This is actually why you find Kanat um, al Arab. تُسَمِّ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم الصَّابِئ لِأَنَّهُ خَرَجَ مِن دِينِ قُرَيْشِ إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ You actually find record of the Quraysh calling our messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم صَابِئ Why? Because he left what they think is their religion. They think, well, he wasn't complaining, so he must have been part of our religion. But he left that and joined Islam. So he left the faith and joined Islam. And that's what makes him a صَابِئ, right? And so that's the term perhaps suggesting a group of people who left some shirk ways and decided they're going to cut themselves off. What I like to think about this group, and again there are other implications, some say these are lost followers of Ibrahim alayhi salam, they, you know, because Ibrahim alayhi salam, you know, he had Ismail alayhi salam, and then for thousands of years there are no prophets, but some teachings of Ismail alayhi salam must have survived, and those who were holding on to whatever they could and cut themselves off and converted out of the dominant religion of their tribes, perhaps they were called Sabi. That could be implied from the use of the word. You know, what I'm inclined to think about these people are, it's actually a timeless phrase for all those who get disenfranchised and disenchanted with the religion or the worldview that they're born into or they're raised in, and they cut themselves off from it seeking the truth. And actually this, in, in a sense, is what the Prophet ﷺ was described as because he was disenfranchised from you know, the religion of his people and he clearly cut himself off from it and in a sense he became Sabi. 
Sabah so, uh, also refers some some say to, to you know people who study the stars who or who look at the stars all the time, so they figure they worship stars. And here it's important to note that this allegation that the Sabians worshipped stars is a, a result of people not understanding a religion when they look at it from a distance. I want to help you understand this concept. It's an important one. When I was in high school in 1836, no, in 1996, uh, I took a, a, a global history class, right? And now Islam is very famous. It's on the news all the time. So I'm sure the textbooks have changed. When I was in global history class in high school, I still remember in Forest Hills in New York City, um, our, there was a world religions chapter. And there was a small column dedicated to Islam. And under Islam, Muslims worship the god of the moon, and that's why they follow the lunar calendar, because they actually believe that God lives on the moon. <laughs> and this is a little half paragraph about Muslims, and that's pretty much all it said. And I was like, I didn't know that about my religion. I'm going to go ask mom what's going on here. Is this why? <laughs> you know, maybe they know something we don't. You know, they look at something from a distance and they assume this is what it must be. They see like Masajid with a crescent moon on top. Like, oh, these guys worship the moon. I see, I see. You see what I'm saying? And of course, why are you celebrating? What's this festival? You brought dates to my house and some obscure meat. You know, why did you bring this to my... Oh, because it's a new moon. It's Eid. Oh, these guys must worship the moon. Like the, these assumptions are made. Similarly, when you don't understand the religious practices of somebody else, you might make these kinds of generalizations or assumptions. Like, I tell you, people make these things... I mean, I've only experienced this as a Muslim. I used to work at a travel agency. Yes, I did. Um, but, you know, and when I did, I used to take... In the break, I used to pray. And my coworker asked me, what is it about that pillar that is so sacred? Because <laughs> you always go there. And you're like praying to it. Like, is there some, is that, is there something happened in your life near that pillar? Like, well, actually, I'm not praying to the pillar. <laughs> so then, you know, to avoid confusion, I used to put a chair there. So his next question was about the chair. <laughs> Did you make a big sale? when you were on that chair. God, I got fired from that job, by the way. Not because of that. I got fired because I booked these tickets for $250, and the guy was so happy. He was so happy. He was like, I've never seen cheap tickets like this before. I was like, you're welcome, sir. This is back when people used to call on the phone and order their plane tickets. They didn't, there was no kayak or nothing, you know? This is back in the day. So I booked these tickets. I'm super happy. I made my first sale. Then the guy shows up the day of, and he's like, you idiot. And I was like, what, what, what did I do? I booked his tickets to Moscow. And he wanted to go to Moscow, except I booked his tickets to Moscow, Ohio. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> that didn't last. I said, let me try learning Arabic. OK, anyway. <laughs> uh, so. And the, and the Sabians, meaning those who convert out of their dominant faith tradition, like, I, you know, there are people that are just liberal, progressive, they've believed nothing their entire life, they were born of agnost parents in, like, you know, in America or Australia or England or somewhere else, and in the middle of their life, they decide, this is not for me, I need to find something that I can actually hold on to, you know? There are people that, they, they become Sabi in a sense. And so you're going to find these kinds of people until the Day of Judgment. And so I feel that this is, uh, Allahu A'lam may be a reference to a particular group, but the generality of the language and the fact that there was so much imagination involved from the early times, Allah teaches, Allah gives us every word in the Qur'an for a timeless purpose. And to find out this obscure group in history may have some benefit, and we still haven't found them. But actually looking at the origin of the word and specifically how the Prophet was addressed. That's the most curious part of this, right? Because when they saw that he's not following their way, they called him a sabi. And that's a pretty telling indication of what this might be a reference to. But anyway, this is the first part of it. These groups, in other words, until the Day of Judgment, any of the people who follow these lines, those who want to aid the truth like the Nasara, those who want to return back to Allah, nahadu, those who find faith, those who leave their dominant tradition and culture and they want to convert out of it, these are basically truth seekers. All of these are truth seekers in any day and age. And that's actually what Allah wants, the people who are seeking the truth. Then He puts 
three conditions, like I said. To believe in Allah, to believe in the last day, man amana billahi wal yawmil akhir, wa amila salihan, and acted righteously. Now notice here, there's no two ba's. It's amana billahi wal yawmil akhiri. The ba is not there in between. And this is a sharp contrast from what you read earlier on in the surah. Amanna billahi wa bil yawmil akhiri wa ma hum bi mu'minin. You saw two ba's there. Here there's no ba in between. When you put two ba's, it means we believe in Allah. And of course we also believe in the last day. You've separated those two things by mentioning in twice. But when you say we believe in Allah or those who believe in Allah and the last day, then you've combined these two as though they are logically connected to each other. They're one, one, you know, part and parcel of each other. What Allah is describing here subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually a necessary consequence of true faith in Allah. When you truly believe in Allah, you believe that He's fair. You cannot believe in Allah and believe that He's not fair. That's impossible because that would take away from His perfection. And part of His perfection is that every injustice that happens in this world, because there is lots of injustice in this world, and it happens in your personal life, it happens among friends, it happens at the level of governments and entire peoples. Injustice is a dominant reality of this earth. How can you believe in a God who is perfect and absolutely fair and yet see all the unfairness around you? You cannot make sense of these two things, these two polar opposites, unless you believe in some kind of machine that this God made that takes all the debit and turns it into credit. He, does all the, he takes all the wrong and makes it right again. And all the right that was unpaid for gets paid for. What is that machinery? Judgment day. That's the last day. Without that machinery, unfairness remains unfair. And people got away with it. Am hasiba ladina ishtarahu sayyat an yasbiquna. People who've done all kinds of crimes, did they think they just got ahead of us? They just escaped? They got too far away that they can't be caught anymore? No. So Allah is now saying the true concept of Allah necessitates a belief in the final day. This was important to say to Banu Israel, why? I keep I'm harping about it over and over. What did they erase from their book? The last day. How can you have real iman in Allah left? You removed the akhirah from it. What concept of a fair God do you have left now? What concept of responsibility do you have left? So the iman in Allah and the last day are lazim and malzum. They are necessary with each other. They go hand in hand. Now, once they go hand in hand, does that affect how you behave? If, if, if you believe in Allah, and as a result you believe in the last day, does that affect your behavior? So it's only logical that the next thing mentioned is what? وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا And they acted righteously as if to say, and therefore they acted righteously. It's a logical consequence. All three of these faiths are logically connected to each other. These items are logically connected to each other. You with me so far? Now this is the, probably the most important part of this entire conversation. There's a, what you can call a difference in point of view. I'm a teacher, I have students. From my point of view, this student did not work hard. And the student, I asked the student, hey, did you uh, do your homework? No. You're not working hard. No, no, I'm a hard worker. His point of view, very confident, is what? He's a hard worker. Me as a teacher, I look at his work. I know him for five years. I've been failing him for five years. He's in the same class. I have a, I have a right to say that he's what? Not, Not a hard worker. Now you have a difference in point of view. Whose point of view is more valid? Mine, because I'm in a position of experience. I know better in this case. I know better in this case. Okay. Somebody claims they believe in God. Somebody claims they believe in God. And Allah says they don't believe. Allah says they don't believe. Whose claim is valid? Allah's claim. How, is that possible that somebody says they believe, but Allah says they don't? Is that possible? Is that difference of point of view possible? Yeah, it is possible. Because to Allah, He's not just judging what comes out of your tongue. He's actually passing judgment of what lies inside of your heart, deep inside of your heart. It's far even beyond action, all, even your intentions. He sees the reality of it. This ayah, when he says, those who believe in Allah, is he talking about those who believe in Allah from their own point of view or from his standards? This is from his point of view. When Allah Azza wa says, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَالِثُ ثَلَاثَ Those who say Allah has, is a third of three, have disbelieved. That is not a statement of iman, that is a statement of kufr. That's from Allah's point of view, that doesn't count as iman. That does not count as iman. So which nasara is he talking about? 
He's talking about the Nasara who don't say Allah is a third of three. You understand? When you, among the Yahud you have those who said, Inna Allah faqirun wa nahnu aghniya. Allah is bankrupt, we're the ones that are rich. That came out of their mouths. When those, those Yahud that said that and after saying that, they say, no, but we still believe in God. God's own point of view is you could say whatever you want, I don't consider that belief in Allah. In other words, belief in Allah is actually what He says belief in Allah is. Not from your point of view. Look, in America, we are a religiously free society. In a state like, you know, Arkansas, you have, I, was in, I used to spend a lot of time in Little Rock before, and in Little Rock, you have the most churches per square mile, and most denominations, most varied denominations. Every one of those churches has a belief in God. But are they all different? Yeah. Completely different points of view on who God is and what He means and what it means to make Him happy. Their faith in God varies so, so, so much. Allah is saying here, not if you feel like you believe in Allah, but you actually believe in Allah as He wants you to believe. And by the way, Allah revealed some things about Himself that we could never have known. There are names of Allah, we could have known some names. He's Ar-Rahman, He's Al-Malik. Like, there are some names a human being can think about and say, he, God is merciful, He is fair, He is in control. You can know those names. There are certain things about Allah you could never have known unless He told you. Right? He could only have told you and otherwise you would never ever have, ever have known. So when Allah says, those who truly believe, who believe in Allah, of all of these groups who believed in Allah as He wants to be believed in. Not according to their own philosophy, but as Allah wants them to believe in it. Now take this a step further. Well, يَوْمِ akhir, The last day. Are there different opinions on what the last day looks like? Do the Christians have a different view? Do the Jews have a different view? If, if a view at all? Do the Muslims have a different view? Do Hindus have some you know, description of it? Do the Mayans have the, you know, a description of what's going to happen at the end of the world? Yeah, you have a variety of views on how the world is going to come to an end. And what it all, it's all going to mean at the end, isn't it? But our Iman is that for every single prophet that Allah ever sent on this earth, did He teach them different views of the last day or the same exact view? It's the same day, the same picture is being painted by Salih alayhi salam and Nuh alayhi salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam and Shu'aib alayhi salam and Isa and Musa and Muhammad alayhi salatu salam. There is no different pictures of Judgment Day according to us. It's one concept of the last day. One concept. But if you look at the reality from our point of view, do Jews today have a different concept of last day? Christians have a different concept of last day? Sabians, who, if they were, would have their own concept of last day. Allah is saying actually only of these people who maintained the belief in the last day as I revealed it. Not from their own point of view, because if they believe in some strange version of it, that doesn't even count as Iman in al al Akhir. This is not an open license to anybody who has some vague concept of God or some vague concept of the afterlife. It's all good. Just make sure that you stop at a red light and you can go to heaven. That's not what this is. And the last part of it is probably the most important. وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا And acted righteously. Acted in a way that is righteous. This is a, the, the, the hal nature of it is really important to understand. Allah is not just talking here about what you do. He's actually also talking about how you do it. That's what the hal does. It doesn't just explain what is done. It explains how it is done. So I want to pray to God. That's the act of prayer. But how you pray has to be good. How you pray has to be good. I want to help someone. It's not just the act of help, but how you conduct that help. What is the mannerism with which you speak to someone? Saying salam to someone is a good deed. But how you say salam can make a lot of difference. Salam alaikum. It can make a big difference. It's not just the what that's important. It's also the, the how. Now the thing is, somebody can have a concept of this is good and this is good and this is good. But the way they're going to do it can only come from revelation. Like every, every, every other person can have their own idea of what is good. Every other person can have relative morality. They could. I mean, there could be some person who yells at their mom and says, Ah, it's okay, it's no problem. She's cool with it. No big deal. That's not how you can talk to your mom. Why not? Because the Quran, revelation will come and say, La lahuma ufin. Don't even say, Ooh. Don't even like, squeeze your, eye, you know, your eyebrows like this. Don't even do that before them. Don't even let them hear an ugh. It's not just what you do for your parents, even how you do it has been talked about. 
Even how you do it has been talked about. It's not just that you pray, it's even how you stand in prayer. These things can only have come from revelation. In other words, it's not some vague, generic concept of being good, but rather they acted righteously in the, the, the same God who introduced himself, the same one who showed them their final destination, also showed them this is what it means to be good. And this is how you act righteously. When you find these people across history, then فَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ Then they have their compensation with their master. I do take a step further. Um, Allah Ta'ala A'lam, what I'm convinced of, I like to share. I like to share that in this ayah, there's a promise from Allah Azza wa Jal to a large contingent of humanity. People in the world that have no idea what Islam is, and if they only know anything about Islam, it's something scary and tainted. The images that they've seen and the unfortunate representation of Islam that either non-Muslims have made or unfortunately even Muslims have made that has polluted the picture of what this beautiful religion is. So they haven't found Islam because we didn't let them. The only reason they haven't found Islam is we didn't let them. There are lots and lots of people, of people in the world who are just really good people. They're really, really good people. And they, wallahi, like if you look at their character, their behavior, their, their, you know, their dealings with people, they make Muslims feel bad. In their honesty, in their integrity, you know, in, in even their spirituality. But the, the thing is they're looking, they're seeking. They're seeking. They're trying to find the truth. And Allah Azza wa has made a promise to all those that are good, that are seeking to find the truth, that Allah will not let their pursuit go to waste. As a matter of fact, this pursuit itself is a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wa wajadaka dalan fahada. He found you lost. You can only get lost when you're looking. You don't, you don't know where to look. He's looking and looking, and then he guided you. Allah will not take those who are looking and seeking and trying to find the truth and let their effort go to waste. Those who sincerely came to Allah. You know, I I even argue Isa alayhi salam. He delivers his message to Banu Israel. And, you know, he, they, they, most of them reject. And centuries later, you have the story of the people of the cave. Ashabul Kahf, that's mentioned in the Quran. These people did not see a prophet. They did not believe in Torah or Injil. They didn't know any of it. All they knew is we can't worship idols. We can't, we can't do that. They had no other concept of Islam than that. That's it. That's all they had. And Allah Azza wa Jal, despite Isa alayhi salam having come, Despite him having come, and them still not knowing about him, they're still heroes in our religion. They're still great in our religion. Because Allah acknowledges those that are seeking, even though we haven't, we, they haven't taken the shahada or they haven't seen Islam yet. They have, it hasn't come before them yet. So passing judgment on people who are in that journey is impossible for you and me. I'm not saying you should look at other people and say, this one's going to heaven, this one's going to heaven. That's none of our business anyway. We can't even say that about ourselves. What are we going to say that about anybody else? But for us to say that no people who have not taken the shahada are definitely going to Jahannam is also an overstatement. That is not what this deen preaches. There's no evidence to that statement across the entire religious literature. That unless people take the shahada you know, and explicitly come to Islam, it does not answer the question of those who were never exposed. You know, it doesn't answer. But these ayat do. These ayat have that room in them. But regardless, when they do find the truth, that truth has to be in line with the teachings of our deen. It has to be in line with مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْسَنُونَ Now just the final comment on this ayah. And that is that the ayah before it and the ayah after it both have to do with revelation. The ayah before and the ayah after both have to do with revelation. How? The previous ayah was يَكْفُرُونَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ إِنْ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يَكْفُرُونَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ They used to disbelieve in the ayat of Allah. What are the ayat of Allah? Revelation. In the next ayah you find وَإِذَا خَذْنَ مِثَاقَكُمْ وَرَفَعْنَا فَوْقَكُمُ الطُّورِ خُذُوكْ بَعَتَيْنَاكُمْ بِقُوَّةٍ When we raised the covenant, when we took the covenant from you, which I'll explain, and we raised the mountain of Tur above you, Hold on to what we've given you with all the might you have. Hold on to what we've given you, meaning hold on to the Torah. Hold on to the book of Allah, which is again, revelation. In other words, the entire passage down to the ayah before and ayah after emphasizes faith in revelation. So if the ayah in and of itself does not mention whoever believed in Allah and the last day and his revelations, it doesn't matter anymore because now the, the entire subject is revelation. And speaking of which, it's not just revelation. You need to focus on these other things too. 
That's what this ayah has highlighted. If you want to rip this ayah out of its context and assume that the Qur'an in this ayah gave no value to revelation, this is actually exactly the crime described in the Qur'an. الَّذِينَ جَعْلُوا الْقُرْآنَ عِلِينَ Those who took the Qur'an and tore it to pieces. You, tore, you tear this piece out and say, look, there's no mention of revelation. What are you talking about? Read the ayah before. If you can't read the entire surah because that's too much work for you, at least read the ayah before. Read the ayah after. <laughs> Even then you, you, you understand that it's not revelation that's being skipped. In any case, let's move forward. Now Allah highlights, وَإِذَا خَذْنَا مِثَاقَكُمْ When we raised the mount, or rather when we took the mithaq from you. Mithaq comes from the word wathiqa, which means to tie something very tight. Mif'al, this pattern, actually suggests a device, a means by which you were tightened up. Mithaq is a contract or a promise by which you are held to account or you're, you're tied to somebody. This is actually a very beautiful expression for revelation itself. Quran is also called a rope. And a rope is something by which you tie. In a sense, a rope is also a mithaq, you know, in, 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 in its literal expression. So, وَإِذَا خَذْنَا مِثَاقَكُمْ وَرَفَعْنَا فَوْقَكُمُ الطُّورِ And we raised right above you a tur, the mountain of a tur. The biblical parable is as follows. On the morning of the third day, there was, a, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke, because he, the Lord, descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from, from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently as the sound of the trumpet grew, grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. So this is a conversation between Musa and Allah Azza wa they, they describe Allah descending, we don't accept that part, but rather that the mountain was actually raised. Now some Bible scholars actually literally believed that it was raised. Others say that it was raised in the sense that they were at the foot of the mountain. And the, the mountain kind of overlooked them. You know if you're standing in front of, at the bottom of a very tall building, like if you've ever been to New York City and somebody wants to show you, by the way, you're right at the Empire State. Seriously? Whoa, and then it feels like it's just falling over you. The idea of a mountain hovering above you, that it's kind of collapsing on top of you. Then the Qur'an uses the word nataqna. If nataqna al-jabala fawqahum ka'annahum, ka'annahu bulna. Which az-za'za'a al-haz, wal-jathab, wal-nafb. Actually, the, the idea of nataqa is to shake. And so it's kind of the image of an earthquake. And an earthquake is happening, and there are boulders and rocks that are on the mountain that are falling. And these people are at the bottom, so they see these giant boulders rolling down, crashing on either side of them, and they're just kind of standing because they're not sure if they run that they're going to be sm you know, smashed. So that's one image of what's happening here. The entire mountain is shaking, and rocks are falling, and this is how Allah raised the tur above them. Meaning He started dropping boulders of it you know, uh, on top of them as it shook. Others have taken a very literal meaning of it, which is possible also, and there's no reason to reject it, like the expression in Surah Al-A'raf, like it was a shadow hovering above them. Like it was literally like an umbrella hovering above them. And they were convinced that it's going to drop right on top of them. Like literally the mountain of Tur is hovering above these people. And as it's hovering above them, Hold on to what we have given you with, all the might, with great might. What is Allah referring to? Torah. He's referring to what I've made halal and what I've made haram. Hold on to these instructions with all your might. Some have some, I remember some emails from a long time ago. Why did Allah have to raise a mountain over their heads and then tell him to take the book seriously? It's like somebody telling you on gunpoint, hey, take Quran seriously. And you're like, okay, 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 I'll, I'll follow it. Yeah, I'll read it. You know, why is he holding a mountain above them? And they're like, oh, no. And then Allah says, Take what I've given you seriously. Hold on to it with strength. Yes, we will. Yeah, uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But that's not genuine, is it? That's not genuine. Because at that point, you're only doing it because you're being held at gunpoint. Or in this case, mountain point. You know, <laughs> that's the only reason. And as soon as the mountain's gone, you're going to go back to your old ways. Or that's not a genuine reason to abide by the law of Allah. So why did Allah use this measure? To understand this question, one has to carefully look at the relationship between ourselves and Allah that is not one-dimensional, it's complex. 
to put it in perspective, the relationship you have with your mom is not one kind of relationship. When she was, when you were a child and she was taking care of you, the relationship was different. As you grew, the relationship became different. When you were negotiating getting married with her, the relationship was different. When she became a grandma, the relationship is different. That it's the same mom and you, but the relationship has gone through lots of changes. And it's not just progressive changes, there are different types, different, different sides to your mom that come out of different occasions. Okay? Sometimes her angry side is necessary. Sometimes her loving side is necessary. Actually, not much different, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى We have lots of dimensions with our relationship with Allah. We have a relationship of love with Allah. We have a relationship of fear with Allah. One of gratitude with Allah. One of loyalty with Allah. One of humility with Allah. One of sharing our joy with Allah. Wanting to talk to Allah. Missing Allah. You know, we have, we have mo and fear of course, is part of the relationship. It's, part, it's a complex relationship. We have a relationship of a student from Allah. One seeking Allah's wisdom, you know putting ourselves in a position of a learner. We have all these different like, kind of dimensions to our relationship with Allah. When something great happens in your life, then there's this sense of gratitude to Allah that overwhelms you. That, that's not the time of fear, it's the time of gratitude. You know? When you've messed up really badly, it's a time of embarrassment before Allah. Maybe even fear of Allah. The thing is, Allah will manifest through His names, right? When you study the names of Allah, which surah and which ayah is talking about which name, Allah is highlighting which part of the relationship is important here. So when He's saying Ghafurur Rahim or Azizun Duntiqam, you know, Qawiyun Aziz, when He's mentioning these names, it's actually highlighting what part of your relationship with Allah is important at this stage. Banu Israel have this unfortunate, one sided relationship with Allah. He loves us no matter what. And no matter what we do, He's not going to. Ah, what's He going to do? We're the chosen ones. Who else is He going to get? We're the only ones. You know, they remind me of post office employees. Sorry if there are any in the audience. You know, you're, you're already secure in your job. Ain't no way you're going to get fired. You're already tenured. So you can take five hours to put a stamp on. It's okay. And if you say, could you hurry? You need to calm down, sir. <laughs> There's no reason for you to take your job seriously now, you know? This attitude of theirs, Allah Azza wa Jal flips the equation and says, you, as, as much as you've taken advantage of the, the, Allah's attribute of love towards you, favor towards you, gift towards you, you've completely ignored the relationship of fear towards Him. That needs to be highlighted. And the more drastic a measure Allah takes is an indication of how drastically far they've gone. This is a scared straight program. So, خُذُوْمَا أَتَيْنَاكُمْ بِقُوَّةً Now, Allah has not done that with us, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah didn't do this, this with this ummah. That's actually an indication that, one, inshallah, we're not that bad. <laughs> that hopefully, we're not that bad. Because when need be, Allah will do this. When need be, He will scare a people straight. وَذْكُرُوا مَا فِيهِ And remember what is in it. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may be protected, so you may be safe. Usually when you say taqwa, safe of the displeasure of Allah, protect yourself, be righteous, be pious. But in this ayah, so you may protect yourself from getting crushed. Because I will crush you. The mountains hovering above them. You better watch it. I, basically, Allah has had enough. And you better remember what's in it. Now in these words, we are learning the relationship that a deteriorated believing nation has to have with their book. Let me say that phrase again so you, it echoes in your head. What is the guidance for a deteriorated believing nation so that they can be protected? Hold on to what I have given you, what we've granted you with great might. What has Allah given us? Quran. The way they were supposed to hold on to Torah, we are supposed to hold on to Quran and holding on to something with great might. What in the world does that mean? Quran is never going to be a casual read for you and me. We're going to pour over every word and we're going to hold on to this guidance and we're going to try to understand it to the best of our ability and then see the world through it as though this is the only guide for our survival. I didn't sh share with you the concept of a taswir al-fanni fil Quran al-kareem, artistic depiction in the Quran. 
One of the most beautiful images in the Quran is in the first ayat of Baqarah. I didn't share it with you, I'll share it with you now. This is a good occasion to share it. When Allah says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدَى لِلْمُتَّقِينَ You can actually turn that into a picture. That's actually a painting. Let me show you how. Imagine for a moment that you are on a journey. It's dark and dangerous. You're up on top of a cliff somewhere. One wrong step and what's going to happen? You're down. You're, you're, done. You're, you're gone. Now, in every step you take, you're being extra what? You're being extra cautious. But you cannot be cautious unless you have some light. Some light. And the, or some direction being offered to you, somebody says, you can't even see for yourself. You're being told, turn left and take three steps. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, just take three steps. Don't take four, because you get killed. Just take three. Okay. The, f the person whose directions you're going to follow, you can't have any doubts in it. If you want to protect yourself, you're going to have to follow the guidance without any doubts. La rayba fihi hudal lil muttaqin. The idea of holding on to guidance with all your might and following it as closely as you possibly can, because if you veer off the path, you're going to, you know, irda, what's literally the Quran calls irda or taradda, falling off a cliff. That's the image described of someone who loses guidance. Literally falling off a cliff. It, you know, habata. They descended. That's not the position we want to be in. So just looking to the book of Allah for counsel on every turn, at every occasion, that's the relationship the Israelites were asked for. And then they were told, وَذْكُرُوا مَا فِيهِ And mention what is in it. It means two things. Remember what's in it, and also means mention what's in it. Why is that important? In this halaqa right now, people are watching live or they're going to watch a recording. You guys are sitting in the masjid, I'm talking. We're in the environment where we're remembering what he says. But then when we leave here, and we're home, and we're in the middle of an argument, or we're about to make a transaction online, or we're about to go drive somewhere to see certain friends, that's the time to remember it. Like right now, it's easy to remember. The time to remember it is when you need it. This is just so it can be reinforced in all the other non-masjid times, the non-Ramadan times. Make mention of what is in it. And the, the beauty of our book, Allah made it easy to memorize. So just you reciting Quran with reflection when you're driving, when you're walking around, when you're just you know, doing nothing, just recite. Just recite. And you will remember the teachings of Allah and they'll come into your life. They'll make their way into life in places you wouldn't expect. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may be, you may be safe. ثُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ Thereafter, you all turned back even after that had happened. This is actually one of the most amazing, amazing things I read on this subject. Uh, I, just, I had no idea. In the Hebrew language, uh, when this story is mentioned, they say, uh, the, the, the way they describe سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا Now we say سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا What does that mean? We hear? We obey. Or nasma wa nuti if you make the mudare, right? We, we listen and we obey. This is how they say this in Hebrew. They say nashma, nashma wa asi, asin, or asin. <coughs> nashma wa asin. And asin in Hebrew means to obey. Quran says, qalu sami'na wa asayna, which is close to the pronunciation to what Hebrew word? Asin. But the thing is, in, in, in Hebrew, asin means what? To obey. But asina in Arabic means to disobey. So the Quran says, you people said, we hear and we disobey. And the Bible is saying, using the same exact phrasing, we hear and we what? Obey. We hear and we obey. The Quran is actually giving the opposite translation. Or is it? The Qur'an is saying, you said we obey, but what you actually meant and what you actually did and how you actually move forward is you disobeyed. This is actually combining the Jewish account, the Hebrew Bible's account, and the Qur'anic account in a remarkable way. I never understood how could the mountain be hovering above them and they say, we hear and we disobey. Because <laughs> if they say that at that time, what's going to happen? So obviously they were going to say what? We hear and we asina, which is for them, we obey. But actually what they meant in their hearts was what? We said, well, I, okay, fine, for now. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And the Qur'an captures that reality so beautifully. When Allah says later on in Baqarah, you, you said, you know, we, we hear and we disobey, disobey. But here we're learning the other dimension of the story. Thumma, thereafter you turned away. You didn't turn away immediately. You didn't disobey immediately. You did that later on. So how did they get out of trouble then? Just by saying we obey, but by meaning we disobey. As if Allah won't know. As if Allah won't notice. ثُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ Then thereafter, you turned away, even after having done that. Even after the mountain hovered above you. فَلَوْلَا فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُهُ Had it not been the favor of Allah on you, and the loving mercy of Allah on you. What is the loving mercy of Allah on these people? The continuous sending of prophets. Quran describes a prophet as a favor of Allah and a loving mercy of Allah. Prophets are not messengers of destruction. Prophets are deliverers of Allah's favor and His loving mercy. And that's what makes Manu Israel special. And had they not had that, لَكُنْتُمْ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ You would have been from those that have lost. What, and so I leave you with just commentary on what, it, what does it mean to be of those that have lost. It does not, you, you would have lost dunya and you would have lost akhirah. What happened to all the other nations that used to have prophets thousands of years ago and over time, did they keep their religion or lose it? They lost it. They lost it. Prophets kept coming and kept renewing Torah. Their corrupt rabbis would make changes to it. And the, the prophets would come and keep fixing it and fixing it and fixing it. And had they not come and constantly fix, they would have been the ultimate losers. They would have lost their faith. They would have lost the revelation. Whatever remnants of revelation we have left today, even that wouldn't have been there if prophets didn't keep on coming, one after the other after the other. Like Rasulullah describes about them. This is the only way you would have saved yourself from, you know, you, you wouldn't have been from the lost. You know what this ayah means for us? It actually means the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal has given us a Qur'an that does not have to be preserved or re-preserved by the coming of new prophets. Is that this ummah will never be khasirin. This ummah will never be losers. Because we always have the greatest treasure that can't even be valued. It's the book of Allah. It's beyond value. So we can, they, they could have lost their book. We can't. We, we can forget our book, that's, that's for sure. <laughs> they misinterpret our book. These people used to change the letters. يُحَرِّفُونَ al kalim. They used to move the words and alter the words from their place. We can't do that with Qur'an. You could even try and do it, and some people have. They just, people just laugh at it. You know? We can't even change the Qur'an if we wanted to. So what's the next best thing? Let's, one, let's not talk about it. Let's ignore it. Let's overlook it. Or worse yet, let's misinterpret it on purpose. Let's present a meaning that we know is not the meaning, just so we can make people happy. This is our attitude towards the Qur'an now. We have more fear of Allah than we have loyalty to the word of Allah. The same word of Allah that says, وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَا The word of Allah is in the supreme place. It's in the highest place. Nothing comes above the word of Allah. But now today, you know, political pressure, social pressure, you know, we got to fit in. What do you say about this issue or that issue? What does your Quran say about this? We think you guys are pretty barbaric. No, 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 that's not what it says. You just, you know, let's just give them an interpretation that will make us look less barbaric. We're in enough trouble as it is, you know. Because otherwise they, they, they might, you know, they might trump the rest of us. So let's just change the way we look at our book. Well, then you're the ultimate losers. Then, then you're losers, you know. We have, to, we have to show an allegiance to this book. And when you do, that is the only time you're protected. In the one minute I have left, I'll share with you one of, to me personally, one of the most powerful insights from this ayah that really, for me, transformed my life and the way I think about the, the book of Allah. It, I, I learned it from what Allah said to the Jews and when He was telling them to hold on to their book. When you hold on to the book tightly, that's not enough. That's not enough. وَذْكُرُوا مَا فِيهِ Then you have to remember what's in it and you have to remind what's in it. You have to mention what's in it. What happens in the Muslim society is there are some people who hold on to the book with all of their might, but they don't share it. They only share it in their own circle. They only, if the, if the people will come to a dars that they're doing, good enough. I'm not going to go to them. You want me to go to those people's houses? Those, those people don't even pray. Those women don't even wear hijab. Those, no, 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 not one of those guys has a beard. You want me to go to their house and talk to them about Qur'an? Or reach them? No, no, no. They should come to the masjid. They should come to me. 
How are you going to fulfill وَذْكُرُوا مَا فِيهِ Mention what is in it. To mention what's in it, the people who are holding on to it have to be ambassadors of it too. They have to reach every nook and cranny and share and share and share and keep mentioning what's in it. And that's how taqwa will come to the people that had no idea what taqwa was. This Qur'an can transform people. You think somebody's conservative, somebody's liberal, somebody's religious, somebody's progressive. These are, in here asma'un. In here illa asma'un samaytu muha. These are names you came up with, man. The hearts are the property of Allah. And when the heart listens to the word of Allah, the way the heart is transformed is beyond my control and beyond your control. Our job is just to share the word of Allah without, without you know, judgment, without bias, without restriction. And then what it does in the hearts of people, that's between them and Allah. That's be- and that's when you get taqwa. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ لِأَنَّ التَّقْوَى فِي الْقُلُوبِ Taqwa is here. So you will develop what is in your hearts. If you do right by this book, you become ambassadors and sharers of this book. You don't have to be a scholar to do so. If you know a little bit about the Qur'an, share it. If you learn something, something small about the Qur'an, Share it, tell somebody about it. Now today, in today's time, sharing something about the Qur'an has become so easy. You could just take a clip of a video and put it on a WhatsApp group or like something or share something or text something. Or God, it's become so easy now. You know, So we have an opportunity to just share. And I'm not just talking about sharing online, but even personally. Just share something about the Qur'an that moved you. By the way, nothing will, nothing will affect other people. And yes, people are moved by what they watch online or what they see. You know, and I, I certainly am a big believer in that. That's why I'm online all the time. But like, what you personally say to someone, ma yakhruju min al-qalb yasilu ila al-qalb. What comes out of a heart goes into a heart. Don't underestimate the value of sharing the word of Allah, even in the smallest capacity. Walau aya, walau aya, with anybody around you. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us carriers of this Quran and make us of those who hold on to this book bi quwwah with all their might and then mention and remind each other of what is in it. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Quran al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyyakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.